So Joseph, I pass the floor to you. Uh, please welcome. Okay. Sorry, I'm just gonna make sure I can see my mouse. <laughs> So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Joseph Pohegan, and I'll be talking to you about my project, I Am He Whose Life and Soul Are Torment, some Sergei Parajanov and Symbolic Biography. I Am He Who, Whose Life and Soul Are Torment is an evening length theatrical composition for three singers and live electronics about the life of Soviet Armenian film director Sergei Parajanov. The work is set to text by the 18th century Ashuk Saya Nova in a symbolic biography style akin to Parajanov's film, The Color of Pomegranates. This project has a focus on the multiculturalism of the South Caucasus with text in three languages and recordings of folk musicians from different cultures in the region. The transcultural aspect was important to both artists, Parajanov and Saya Nova, who are Armenians living significant parts of their lives in Georgia, with Parajanov stating in 1988, everyone knows that I have three motherlands, I was born in Georgia, worked in Ukraine, and I'm going to die in Armenia. Parajanov was born in 1920, 1924 to Armenian parents in Tbilisi. He studied film in Moscow and was active across multiple Soviet republics notably Ukraine, Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan. He had two marriages, the second of which resulted in a son and was in prison multiple times and frequently ran into trouble with the Soviet authorities. He died in Yerevan in 1990, just one year before Armenia became an independent country. And today there's a museum dedicated to his work in the center of Yerevan. Parajanov is known for his use of tableau style shots, the influence of miniature painting, religious imagery, and the use of very little dialogue in his films. You can see a list of his films here, four of which are feature films, which are all in different languages. Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors was his big breakthrough film and a very important film in the history of Ukrainian cinema. The Color of Pomegranates, is his most celebrated work and symbolizes a return to the homeland as he returned, in a sense, to Armenia to make this film, which, as I mentioned, was about the Ashuk Sayat Nova. He had struggles with suppression of his work during his lifetime, and that's why you can see there's a gap in his list of films between The Color of Pomegranates and The Legend of Storm Fortress, when he was either imprisoned or barred from filmmaking, and during that time, he actually turned to making visual art, both in prison and when he was out but couldn't make films. After his return to filmmaking, he made a film in Georgian, The Legend of Saram Fortress, and his final completed film was Ashok Karib, which is in Azerbaijani. Language, as I mentioned, was very important to his films. An example of this would be his first film, Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors, which is in the Hutsul dialect of Ukrainian as it was filmed in the Carpathian region of Western Ukraine. And when it was being prepared for Soviet wide release, he insisted that it was not dubbed into Russian as would have been common practice in the time period. So we'll watch now some examples from his four feature films so you can get a sense of what they're like. And we'll start with Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors. Слава Иисусу! 
Слава Ісу. Навіки Богу. Next, let's watch an example from The Color of Pomegranates, which is his film in Armenian. And here's an example now from his Georgian films, The Legend of Serum, Serum Fortress. last completed film in Azerbaijani, Ashok Kerib. The title of my composition, I am he whose life and soul in, are torment in Armenian and Martinim umgink nohokin dan janke, is a line from Sayat Nova, which is repeated four times at the beginning of Parajanov's The Color of Pomegranates, against images of ancient Armenian manuscripts, bleeding pomegranates, 
and a Comanche, which is the instrument that Sayat Nova is often depicted playing in images of the Ashur. It's been noted by multiple people, including Parajano scholar James Stephan and writer Naritza Maktosyan, that this line of poetry may easily be read as referring to Parajano himself, given the director's publicly stated personal identification with Sayat Nova and his personal and professional persecution in his home country of the Soviet Union. According to Stefan, Parajanov wrote this line in the original Russian script, most likely originating from Lipskerov's translation of the poem, I am only the servant of experienced Ashuks. He concludes that the Armenian language version in the film, in Martinim Ungit Nohokin Danjanke, likely comes from Moros Hasratyan's published Armenian translation, which, according to Armenian anthropologist and historian Levon Abrahamyan, is stylized following the Tiflis dialect of Armenian used by Sayat Nova. So let's watch now the beginning of the color pomegranate so you can see that scene where the line is repeated. El So as I mentioned, Sayat Nova was an 18th century Ashuk, also called Ashuk, which is a tradition of singer poets throughout the South Caucasus. Like Parajanov, he was an Armenian living in Georgia. And as I mentioned, was also the subject of Parajanov's film, The Color of Pomegranates. Also like Parajanov, he was exiled and prevented from creating his art, first to Anzal on the shores of the Caspian, and then later to the Hakpat Monastery in the Lori region. Sayat Nova sang in Georgian, in the Tiflis dialect of Armenian, and the Irum dialect of Azeri, as well as occasionally in Persian and Russian. He was writing in a multicultural setting, but was open about his Armenian identity writing in one of his Azari poems, consider Sayat Nova's religion. He does not deny it, he is an Armenian. Sayat Nova was especially influenced by Persian poetry, itself related to the Arabic Ghazal, and this can be seen in the structure of his poems. The structure of most of the poems that I use follow the rhyme, screen, rhyme, uh, rhyme scheme that you can see on the slide with the A being the ratif, or the repeated refrain at the end of the first line of each line in the first section and the last line of each following section. He often borrows from other languages in his poems, especially Persian, and sometimes wrote poems in multiple languages, one of which I will be using in my piece and we'll talk about later. Let's look at one of those poems. Ashkarumis Afshim Kashi, which is one of his most famous Armenian songs. The form, as I mentioned before, is A A A A B B B A C C C A, and so on. And in this example, the Radif is Is Ins Ama, which is bolded for those who can read Armenian on the left side. 
So you can see it's at the end of the first line of each line in the first section and the end of the last line in each following section. The radif is preceded by a rhyming pattern called kafia. In this example, kani vurjan, oske punjan, zarbab vuran, sultanu khan. So the kafia and the radif together in the first section, kani vurjan isin sama, oske punjan isin sama, zarbab vuran isin sama, sultanu khan isin sama. And that rhyme pattern is uh, followed at the last line of each following section. So I'll read you now the entire first section of this song, and then we'll listen to a performance by Levon Katerjian. Ash harumis ax chimkashi, kani vurjan is in sama. An mahakan jirov likan, oske punjan is in sama. Nestim vures shavak anis, zarbam varan. Is in sama. Suchis imatsi enen spane sultanu khan is in sama. So I'll be taking the text from this and several other Sayat Novo songs and setting them to new music in my composition. Of course, being aware of this rhyme, screen, rhyme scheme and the form of the poems. I was using several sources for the Sayat Novo songs. Um, one of the main ones was Charles Dowsett's book on Sayat Novo, which includes explanations of the many poems and their formal structures as well as English translations. There's also Henrik Pachinyan's book of the poems in Armenian, written in the Armenian script, which was very helpful. And I also spoke with Lilith Yanjakian, who is an Ashuk specialist in Armenia, which is very important for understanding the context of Sayat Nova's place in the world of Ashuk, especially as an Armenian. And finally, I've been working with a specialist in Tbilisi urban song, Ino Nayashvili, on the Georgian songs, uh, and as you can see here, this is one of the main primary sources, the Davtar or Tetrak of 1765. The other main primary source is the 1823 uh, manuscript written by Sayat Nova's younger son, Ion. Ion's manuscript is written entirely in the Georgian script and the Tetrak. The Armenian poems are written mostly in the Georgian script and the Azari poems in both Armenian and Georgian scripts. So you can see in this photograph that I took at the Museum of Literature and Art after Yayeshe Charens in Yerevan. On the left side, you have the Armenian script, and on the right side at the top, you have Armenian, and at the bottom, you have Georgian. Dowsett proposes that Syed Nova felt that the Georgian script was more appropriate for his Tiflis Armenian dialect as opposed to the Constantinople or Yerevan Armenian dialects, which were eventually codified into Western and Eastern Armenian. 
In his book, Dowsett does not attempt to correct Syatnova's Azari poems from the Georgian and Armenian scripts, which do not reproduce the vocalic harmonies of Azari and do not distinguish between some similar sounding vowels. He says, quote, to do so would be rash since it is unlikely that the strict rules followed in literary Western Turkish obtained in the 18th century Azari of Georgia. I follow this convention in my musical setting, sticking with the pronunciations of the Azari poems, which are in the Irem dialect, a language less familiar to Syat Nova than Armenian or Georgian, as they are represented by the alphabet Syat Nova wrote them in. In a way, this fits within Parajanov's practice of employing a sort of fake ethnography in some of his films. In any case, putting them into contemporary Azerbaijani risks flattening the historical dialect, and I want to maintain any imperfections in the poetry as Syat Nova documented it. My composition is structured in eight scenes with a prologue, each focusing on a different period of Parajanov's life spanning several Soviet republics, nearing his importance to cinema, not only in Georgia, where he was born, but also in Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Ukraine. The abstracted series of scenes representing the different part, periods of his life are similar to his treatment of Syat Nova in the symbolic biography style in The Color of Pomegranates. There will be no dialogue in the entire piece, no text other than the text from Syat Nova's songs. As you can see, I chose songs in different languages and created a new structure with them over the course of the hour long piece, alternating between them and in some cases combining fragments from different languages. So in the last scene, you can see there's a fragment from an Azari song and a fragment from an Armenian song. I also cut parts of these poems uh, just for length in my musical setting in that way also creating new formal structures within each scene. Syat Nova writes his name at the end of each of his songs as is, would have been a common practice. And in my piece, I'll be replacing the word Syat Nova with Parajanov in a way, creating the setting of Parajanov as a contemporary Ashuk in the Transcaucasus. Three different singers will play Parajanov over the course of the work two men and one woman, which is in a way a nod to his casting of Syat Nova in The Color of Pomegranates, in which Sophie Gocciarelli, the Georgian actress, played both Syat Nova and his love interest, Princess Anna. Let's look now at the poem that I'll be using in the prologue, which is a poem in four languages, very unique amongst his works. So it's in Georgian, Persian, Azeri, and Armenian, and he alternates between those four languages at the half line in the first section and at every line in each following section. He follows a similar rhyme scheme to what I mentioned before, but in this case, the rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B, C, 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 B, D, 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 B, and so on. And I'll read you just the first section of this song so you can get a sense of what these languages sound like mixed together. So we're starting with Georgian, then Persian, and then Azari, and finishing with Armenian. Esra momi vida, bibin chikardem, varget boheni buruch, tanen dusarats, chukvat sava gebine, as sheshinardem, bivan na geziram, banen dusarats. This is the text that I'm using in the final scene of the piece. It's a combination of fragments from a poem in Azeri and a poem in Armenian. As you can see, either in the originals or in the translation, there's this theme of reflecting back on the artist's life toward the end, thinking about death and making that connection again between Syat Nova and Parajanov. In the first section the, from the Azari poem, he talks of the old master building his bridge, setting a, mark, a rock to mark his grave. And in the Armenian, which is, again, one of his most famous Armenian songs, there's this idea of not being understood in one's time, which can be true both uh, for either artist. Amen Mart Chikana Chemi Juren, Urish Juren, not everyone can drink of my water, it is of another water. 
Amen Marx Chicano Carta in Guren, Urish Gurene. Not everyone can read my writing. It is of a different script. In the electronics, I'll be sampling audio from Parajanov's The Color of Pomegranates and from the album Mountains of Tongues. The soundtrack to The Color of Pomegranates was composed by the Armenian composer Tigran Mansurian. It features Armenian instruments of Mansurian's compositions and also Sayat Nova's songs. Mountains of Tongues, Musical Dialects of the Caucasus is a record released by the Sayat Nova Project founded by Ben Wheeler, Stefan Williamson Fa, and Anna Harbach. The recordings were made across Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan in 2012 to 2013 as a way of documenting the South Caucasus region's heterogeneous musical landscape. Recordings were made in a variety of languages and intentionally go beyond the national culture making of the three countries, highlighting less well-documented and minority musical traditions. I decided to use these recordings because I felt that the theme of this project really fit within my goals with my composition. And I thought it would also be interesting to have a mix of languages within each scene. So for example, in scene one, the song that I'm sampling is in Azeri, but the song being sung live by the live singers will be in Georgian. So we'll have this mix of languages even in one, in one scene. So let's listen now to a short medley of each of these songs from Mountains of Tongues that I'll be sampling and doing live electronic processing in my piece on. will be visually projected using video that's being uh, has been filmed or is being filmed over the course of this summer in Georgia and Armenia. 
I've been working with uh, Blue Kolamyan in Armenia and Gizi Amarajubi in Georgia to film these scenes and choose locations that were important either to Parajanov's life or to his films. And you can see those locations here and I'll show you what those look like. The way that this works is the singer will stand directly in front of the projected scene in a way becoming part of the scene as if they were one of the actors in Parajanov's film. And we try to maintain that tableau style from Parajanov's film, uh, but just removing the actor and in place putting the live singer. So you can see in this video here how there will be some movement in the background. The first scene will be set in a Tbilisi cityscape representing the city of Parajanov's childhood. Scene two was filmed at a theater in an abandoned Soviet era sanatorium near Yerevan. And I visited this location last year actually when I was in Armenia. And I remembered these reels of film that were just lying around that made me think of this scene. And you can see some of those in the foreground. Scene three was filmed at the Ortachala prison in Tbilisi, which is now a cultural center. And this was where Parjanov was held in pretrial detention in the 1980s. Scene four was filmed at Uplitsuhe, which was one of the filming locations in Parjanov's film, The Legend of Saram Fortress. Scene five is still being filmed now, and that'll be set in Lori, uh, most likely at the Hachpat Monastery. Scene six also being filmed at an abandoned prison in Gyumri. Scene seven is at the Kvetera Fortress Church in Georgia. And the final scene was filmed outside the museum, uh, Parajana Museum near the Rostan Gorge in Yerevan. And you can see a bit uh, Mount Ararat in the background there. Here you can see an example of how the stage will be set up and the performers will be spread throughout the space. So as I mentioned, the singer will be standing in front of the screen. We'll have the six live electronic players on either side and each performer will have one speaker so that we'll be able to spatialize the sound around the audience depending on the orchestration of the piece. Now I'll show you a little bit about how the live electronic processing will work. We'll be using some different external controllers to control the live processing of the electronic sounds. And one of those is a micro bit, which you can see an example of here. It's a little programmable uh, device. Uh, so there's some buttons on the front and there's some lights that you can program. And on the back, there's an accelerometer which measures X, Y, and Z axis. So X this way, Y this way, and Z, whether it's facing up or facing down. So those numbers get sent to the computer and then I'll program those numbers to go into a program called Max MSP, which will then control the live processing. And one of the ways that I'll be doing that is using a process called granular synthesis. And you can see an example of what that looks like, the controls for that uh, on the, in the middle of this slide. And so I'll be able to control what's called the grain uh, duration. So the grain is just pulling out a little chunk of the audio file. So I'll be able to control how long that is, how often the system spits them out, and then also changes in pitch. And then of course will be the X, Y, and Z axes on the micro bit. So I'll show you an example of how that works. We'll watch uh, just part of a scene from the color of pomegranates. So you can hear what the audio sounds like uh, uh, manipulated, and then I'll play you an example of it going through granular synthesis.
And now let's listen to an example of taking that audio and putting it through granular synthesis using the micro bit controller. And you'll hear the different elements, such as the puck strings, the bells, and those tiles falling on the comanche being rearranged. In the final scene, I'll be imitating the singing pots from the last scene of The Color of Pomegranates. Uh, and so I'll be taking a tiny little Bluetooth speaker and putting it inside a sort of resonant object with a lid. And I'll be able to open and close the lid to change the sound. I'll show you the scene from the film first. So you'll see that the sounds of Sayat Nova's Asharumis Achchinkashi are emanating from Yeriki. these pots at the top of a church. And this is the character of Sayat Nova. So eventually I'll have some larger pots, but for now I'll show you using this one how that'll work. I took that recording and playing it through the Bluetooth speaker inside of here, and you'll see how the sound changes as I open and close the lid.
So as I'm opening and closing the lid, I'm changing the resonance space that the speaker is able to send the sound into. And you can imagine six of those spread out across a room, creating this sort of choir around the audience. Although I started developing ideas for this project shortly before the 2020 Artsakh War, the post-war context that we're in now has further shaped the relationships between peoples in the region in devastating ways. And I think it's such that it's inescapable, inescapable to think of this uh, with this project. It's uh, done things like we still have included, uh, we still have continued attacks on the Armenian-Azerbaijani border. There's been erasure of Armenian monuments and there's been an upended political process that's been meant to permanently solve the crisis and determine the status of Artsakh's Armenians. And of course, recently we've just seen Armenians being removed from their homes uh, with the handover of the Lachian Corridor for fear of what would happen to them under Azerbaijani rule. This project is not meant to solve the Artsakh crisis, nor was it meant to even be about the conflict, which as I mentioned is sort of now inescapable but rather it's to show that we should not restrict ourselves to one national culture. Ankar Janov and Syed Nova can both create beautiful art, not only in Armenian, but also in Georgian and Azeri. And hopefully I can do this without falling into the pitfalls of the instrumentalization of Syed Nova for national policies in the Soviet Union. The political implications of creating such a work would not be foreign to Parajanov. His final film, Ashok Kerib, which was filmed primarily in the Azerbaijani SSR and has a focus on Azerbaijani culture, was released in 1988 at the start of the Karabakh movement in Armenia and Artsakh. In fact, he filmed two additional scenes to the film in response to the nascent conflict in early 1988, just weeks before the Sumgate pogrom, the killings and attacks on the Armenian residents of the town of Sumgate in Azerbaijan in February 1988. And the stills from one of those scenes is the background for this slide. Parajanov acknowledged the conflict and its impact on his work in a September 29, 1988 interview that according to Parajanov scholar James Stephan, given some of the specific terms he uses, reveals the extent to which his views on nationalities has been shaped by the official Soviet ideology, which was becoming increasingly out of step with the emerging nationalism sweeping the soon to be independent countries of the South Caucasus and the entire Soviet Union. He said, quote, the cultures of peoples, especially of neighbors are vessels for communicating with each other. Art and first of all, cinema as the most popular art form should further the mutual drawing together of people. It has become practice to make films jointly with foreign partners, and this, of course, isn't bad, but is everything all right in our own home in this respect? For example, we, the filmmakers of Transcaucasia, the spokesmen of Brotherly Peoples, have never filmed a single picture together. Thank you all for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions now.